Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Devin Bell. I am here with Rocky Nook Publishing and also CT Digital Photography Magazine. And we are fortunate today to have author Robert Fisher with us, a.k.a. Bob. <laughs> what do you want to go by? Do you go by Robert or Bob? What's your preference? Either, either one. doesn't matter. Either one. Let's stay formal. We'll call you Bob. Just so, um, uh, Bob wrote a great book that is coming out through uh, Rocky Nook, and it is the Digital Zone System. Does that look backwards to you guys? Nope, nope, looks perfect. Great. Um, the book came out last month, and it's now available um, in bookstores and also online in various places like Amazon and um, Barnes and Noble and O'Reilly Media. And today we're going to talk about the book and um, his inspiration for writing it and a little bit about the digital zone system. So I will let um, the people who have joined us today and uh, Mr. Fisher introduce themselves. Um, Jack, why don't you go first and then we'll let um, Bob go into, uh, um, we'll, that way Bob can just segue into talking about the book. But. Well, certainly. Uh, well, Devin, always good to see you. And Bob, uh, congratulations. Um, I'm Jack Howard, author of Practical HDRI, uh, most recently the second edition using uh, HDRI imaging, using Photoshop, CS5, and other tools. And fortunately, Adobe was kind enough to not do much with CS6, so it didn't need a refresh um, as far as HDRI goes. Uh, they made a lot of major refreshes, but nothing in HDRI. Um, hey, Bob, you know, on a personal note, congratulations. It's... Uh, I, I had a chance to look through your book over the past couple of days, um, and it's it's beautifully written, thorough, comprehensive, and uh, still trying to wrap my head around it. Uh, but what I really like about it, and you know, because it's a Rocky Nook title, it's amazingly well researched, gorgeously illustrated, and um, very methodical. And it it's it's actually like a teaching book. It's not just there's gorgeous pictures, but it's not just pretty pictures to dazzle. It's there's a very much an educational component, and I uh, I really look forward to digging into that. I mean, between this and uh, H the HDR Handbook uh, version two, it's uh, it's a lot of heavy reading this month. Um, <laughs> but I'm excited to to steal some techniques from uh, some of my favorite photographers. Thanks, Jack. Um, thanks also for joining us. Um, it's always nice to have you in on the hangouts and. Uh, yeah, it's good to see you. All right, Bob, you want to go ahead and tell us a bit about yourself, and then we'll start talking about the book and why you got the crazy idea of writing one. <laughs> uh, sure. Th um, thanks for, for having me, Devin. Thanks for hosting this. Jack, thanks for joining in, and, and it's a pleasure to uh, finally sort of meet you, uh, at least uh, in cyberspace anyway. Um, and thanks very much for the kind words. I, I do definitely appreciate it. Um, I'm a, I'm a photographer and, and freelance writer. I'm I'm Canadian. I'm based in a, in a little city called Oshawa, just outside Toronto, about half an hour. And my my primary uh, commercial photography is uh, is architecture and and some product, but mostly architecture. Um, I'm a, I'm a freelance writer as well, and I, I do uh, I've done some writing for uh, finance publications. My background, you know, many many years ago when I finished university was in finance. Uh, and that's uh, where I worked for a number of years, and uh, that's where I started writing the uh, the finance articles, and then um, uh, got the the photography bug uh, probably about thirteen or fourteen years ago, and played around with it as a as a, as a sideline for a number of years, and then about four or five years ago, I decided to um, to do something more with it and and start trying to earn my living from it. Um, as far as, as the motivation to write the book, it's kind of twofold. Uh, I got my start with film, and I, I shot 35 millimeter medium format and large format, and both color and black and white. And I was never I was never a very good darkroom printer. Uh, I understood I understood the zone system, how it worked, and, and, and what it did, and and why it worked. But I was never a very good darkroom printer, so. When I started getting into scanning my film and working first in Photoshop Elements, and um, the first uh, the first printer I worked with was uh, uh, an old uh, what was the first Epson 2200 was really the first uh, 
big commercially available uh, printer that was accessible to, to the masses. And I, I liked what I was able to do um, digitally in terms of enhancing my photos and, that I couldn't do in the darkroom. And that sort of motiv motivated me to, to move fur further along. And I, I kept scanning film for a number of years. I didn't buy my first digital camera until 2007. But um, when, I, when I did and started working with true digital images and, and raw images um, and, and getting more and more into, particularly into converting to black and white, some of the techniques that are, are available in Photoshop um, are, are good, but they weren't working as well as I had hoped or, or, or as, as well as I had wanted. So I started looking for other ways to, to try and figure out how I could get the, the, the look that I wanted in my, in my pictures. And that's when I started thinking about, reading about um, uh, brightness ranges and dynamic range and that type of thing. And I started thinking about how I could work with the, the brightness or the luminance that's already in the, the, the digital image. And so that started me getting doing some research and I f started finding out about luminance masks. And from there, it just all sort of snowballed. And from learning about luminance masks to, um, to figuring out how you can manipulate those and create ever smaller uh, ever smaller divisions of those masks and then work with them individually that's really what what was led me to you know this this digital zone system and I, I discovered that I could I could create sort of pseudo one-stop zones that mimicked what Adams had come up with um, in in his zone system and by doing that I could then manipulate those individual small areas more easily than I could by doing uh, dodging and burning with, with the painting tools that are available in Photoshop. I, I never found those overly precise, and I never found the quality of, of the, the result to be what I was really looking for. Mm -hmm. But this gave me, gave me something I was looking for. So when I, I started working with this, I decided that maybe some other people would, would like it as well or find it useful. So that's, that was part of the reason why I started writing the book. Um, the other reason, uh, a little more selfish, was uh, that I had a friend. I have a friend who is a, a writer and a publisher, a writer and an editor, and he, a uh, number of years ago, went on a a, um, a retreat or a residency, and it's uh, it's called the Pierre Burton Residency, and it's for Canadian authors who have published books. And Pierre Burton was a Pierre Burton was a, a very well known writer here in Canada. And he grew up in Dawson City, Yukon. When he died, he left his childhood home in a trust with money so that it would be maintained. And the, 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 the purpose of the trust was to allow Canadian writers to go and live in his childhood home for anywhere from one to three months. And it was a way to sort of get away from the day-to-day grind and just be able to concentrate on writing or whatever it was they wanted to, to work on. And this friend of mine applied and he went and he raved about the experience. So I decided I want to have that experience. Mm -hmm. So that was the, the more sort of selfish motivation to write the book. Um, and uh, when, I, when I signed the contract with Rocky Nook, I was very, very happy. I went on to the website of the, uh, of the, of the trust started looking through and finding out where you apply and whatnot, and I got to the rules, and I got very disappointed because they don't allow pets. Oh, and I have, no. and I have, um, and I, I, I couldn't, I, I, I couldn't leave my dogs for, uh, for three months. Um, it's just not practical. So the peer written residency will have to wait. Oh. So those are, those are the sort of the two reasons why I, uh, why I, I wrote the book. I'm sure your dogs appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no doubt they do. Although I'm sure they would have appreciated more that they were allowed to go on the trip with you. but I think they would have enjoyed it. Yeah, that's too bad. Oh, hey, um, hold the chair. We actually have uh, Matthias, our project manager. Hi, guys. How are you doing? <laughs> Stop and say hi. 
<laughs> you guys have both worked with Matthias, so you know him. Yes. <laughs> nice to meet you. Hey, how are you? Hi, Matthias. Hi there. <laughs> so you can blame him for keeping you on schedule Always. and cracking the whip. When right, bring it on. <laughs> pages are due. <laughs> Bye, guys. Have fun. <laughs> Get back to work. <laughs> on my way. Um, right on. Well, thank you for uh, thank you for sharing that because I think that uh, you know there are a lot of photographers out there that are either hoping to get published, whether articles in magazines or writing full books, and um, sometimes it's. Uh, not just being inspired by the subject matter that will motivate you enough to uh, write the book. Sometimes you have to have a little bit more behind it because it's a it's a tedious task. And uh, you know, I've always been on the other side of it, so um, I know. But I know how much hard work you guys put into it and how time consuming it really is. Um, but uh, hold on, I was looking at my questions to ask. But uh, was there anything else that you wanted to add as far as like your motivation for getting out there and writing the book? Because there are, I mean, there there are other books on the digital zone system out there, uh, like blogs and stuff with tutorials and. There are. Um, none of them. None of them take a uh, take the same approach I've taken. Um, uh, and most of them, most of them concentrate on on. Um, most of them seem to concentrate on the metering side, mm -hmm. and and what for what a lot of people call the place and fall approach to to metering, um, which is you know put your important important tonal detail where you want it, and then everything else replace your important tonal detail where you want it, and then everything else falls where it may. Um, that seems to be what most of them um, uh, concentrate on. Um, I, I haven't seen any any anybody else that has taken this kind of approach um, to to a digital zone system. Okay. Um, maybe if you could just give us the Cliff's Notes version of and sorry, that's probably a registered trademark. I can't say that, but uh, how about the uh, abbreviated version of first of all, what the zone system is, just for those people out there and maybe the new photographers like me who don't aren't familiar with it. Sure. Well, the zone system it was a was a, a methodology that was developed or created by um, Ansel Adams and Fred Archer. Um, Fred Archer doesn't get the notoriety uh, or the or the acclaim, but he was involved as well. Uh, but it was Ansel Adams is, is known as the father of the zone system. And what it was, what it is, is a methodology for exposing and developing and printing that allows you to have pretty precise control of the tonality in your in your photos and it involved Adams knew how film reacted to light he knew how film reacted to development chemicals and he knew what he could do in the dark room to manipulate um, gray tones as well. He worked primarily in, in black and white. So um, it, it was a methodology for controlling everything from exposure to development to printing to give him the, the, the look he wanted, the tonality he wanted in his prints. And for, for Adams, and I think for most photographers, the print is the is the ultimate expression of a, of a of a photo. Even in today's digital age, where we can see things up on a computer screen, um, you know, we don't sell we don't sell computer generated images to to um, art buyers or collectors. Uh, we sell them prints. So even today, the print is still the the ultimate expression of a of a photograph. Mm -hmm. So that's that's basically what the zone system was. In really short, is a way to control tonality. Throughout the whole process, and that's that's what I've tried to do with this process as well. Is from exposure, making sure that you can get your 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 tones right on the sensor, and then controlling them and manipulating them through development, which is the digital darkroom, and then 
uh, we can't do the same kinds of things in printing that you can do in the in the traditional darkroom. It all has to be done um, in in Photoshop. Um, but to generate a, a final print that that you're happy with. Mm -hmm. So basically, it's all about just getting the best end product that you can possibly get within right. the, you know, with whatever software you're using. Now, is it specific to Lightroom and Photoshop? Um, probably not. Um, there are other, there are other, other image editing. There are certainly other raw processors out there. So you could you could process your raw images in. Uh, you know, Capture One or or any of the other raw converters that are out there, and that could be your starting point. There are other uh, there are other image editors out there that have some of the the utility of Photoshop. Uh, the GIMP is one that is it's free and it's it's generally pretty good, but none of them have all that Photoshop has. Um, so. If if you really want to employ it, then yes, I would say that Photoshop is the is the is the way to go. And Bob, of course, you're talking about <clears throat> the flagship version of Photoshop, not the Elements, because I, I don't believe that even Elements has really come a long way from when it used to just be the way back when it was bare bones Photoshop. It's really become a robust program on its own. But the one thing it doesn't have is that luminance masking um, and the luminosity controls. Which are so critical in this own system, correct? Right. Yeah. No. It's 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 the full blown version of Photoshop. Yeah. Um, Elements um, Elements has you know as you say a lot of the things that that Photoshop has now, but it's still missing some things. It's still missing some things on the color management side, um, and I think some of the masking and whatnot that you talk about, I think, is still missing from from Elements. So yeah, it's it's the full blown full blown version of Photoshop that I'm talking about. Okay. Well, why don't we um, share some of your images, and maybe you can talk a little bit about the process. Sure. Um, let me, because I know, let me do cease. Just one second. Screen share. And here we go. Okay. Okay. If you want to pull up the third image down on the left, um, the one below, the one below the green one. That one? Oh, the one below the green one. Sorry, yep. my other left. <laughs> this is one that's in the book, and this is this is one that when I started working with with this Sorry. methodology. Whoop. Sorry, it's back. Oh. When I started working with this methodology, um, this is this is a, this is a perfect example of what I was talking about in terms of the the dodging and burning and how I, I wasn't happy with what could be done in in um, Photoshop with the traditional tools. If you look at the back of this of this image, you see the lighter areas in the trees, and at this magnification, it looks it looks fine, um, but if you get in close. You'll see that that it's it's not really all that precise because I was using painting tools um, to to do this dodge to do this dodging and burning work, and you know when you're working on really small leaves like this, it's hard to be to be absolutely precise. So if you want to flip now to the the other version of this, which is um, on the right, the second version on the right. This one. Yep. Now, Bob, please don't talk for a second so that the image will stay on screen because Devin is pulling these up on her computer. Every time you start talking, it's going to pop over to you. So okay. everybody should stand. Well, I've got it. I thought I, sorry, Google Hangout technicality. I thought I had it frozen so that it's only my view. Are you continuing to see Bob when he talks then, Jeff? I keep seeing it. I keep seeing Bob, but now I'm seeing just the picture, so it's working perfectly now. Okay. Okay. Sorry that. Okay. Okay. Um, so, in this way, it's the same picture, and it looks. I should. Uh, what I should have done is I should have. Uh, I should have put these side by side, but it's the same picture, but the the result is a bit different because 
the actually hang on. You know what, Devin? I think I think if because you froze that, yeah. I think it actually. I don't think the other picture pulled up. I think that's the same one. Okay, hold on. Close. That's better. That's it. Okay. There we go. Um, so it's the same picture, but if you look in the back now, you can see that rather than just particularly up on the uh, on the um, sort of toward the, the the left side at the back. Um, instead of just sort of a, a similar mass of light colored gray, now there is there is separation between some of the the lightness in some of the leaves. And similarly on the on the right side, uh, you've got different shades of gray that didn't I couldn't bring that out easily with the traditional painting tools that you use to do this kind of this kind of work, but with with the ability to use masks and work with the lightness that is actually exists in the image, mm -hmm. which is what you're doing. I can I can you can capture a very small range of lightness and then use curves or levels or whichever whichever tool you want to manipulate just that very small area. And it's very precise. So this was when I when I when I first as I say when I first started working with this, this image in particular really was the one that said I said, okay, this this works. This this is something that that I think I can use and could be useful. Um, so um, and that really this this particular picture really sort of motivated me to to try and move forward and uh, and and. Put down the methodology in in writing. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to move to the green, if you want to pull up the green image, this is a this is a wild violet that um, actually grows in my backyard. And when the light hits it the right way in the morning, um, you get some really nice sheen on the leaves. And that's what I wanted to capture, and I didn't want it in color. I wanted it in black and white. So, if you pull up the top left image, Devin. Uh huh. That one. There we go. Are you seeing it now? Um, Is that the right one? It's got the wrong caption on it. Oh. <laughs> but yeah, look, 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 look. Hold on, let me turn it again. There we go. Okay. Got it? That's it. Okay. So, this, this is what I came up with using um, Adobe Camera Raw to create the the black and white, and it's pretty good. It's got it's got up here in the top. Uh, you see this this one darker leaf, and um, it's it's got and then over here on the left, there's another. A leaf that's a little bit darker, and the tones are pretty good, but it it struck me as being a bit flat. So now, if you if you would close that one and pull up the one beside it, all right. Yep, that's it. This this one to me is more what I was looking for. Um, what I find with this one is that it has it has a more three-dimensional look than the other one. Um, it has better uh, it has it has better global contrast in terms of the range from from uh, lights to darks and it has better local contrast in terms of the um, in terms of the vein, veining on the leaves and whatnot. And this was done this was done using the, the digital zone system and I find that this also has more, um, more life, more more luminance than the other one did, and the reason, or a, a part of the reason why, I think that it's possible to do this, is because, in the original, you're dealing with with, pretty much a single, 
color. You're dealing with pretty much with green. There's, there's yellow as well, but it's pretty much green and yellow. So when you start moving around the green slider in, in um, grayscale mode in, in Adobe Camera Raw, you're affecting all of the tones across the image. Mm -hmm. Whereas with the ability to use these, these brightness masks, these, these luminance masks, you can pick up on the more subtle tonal differences and isolate them and work on them individually and adjust them to give you the, the global and lo local contrast that you want that I don't find I can get with the traditional tools in, in uh, Lightroom or Camera Raw or the traditional black and white adjustments in, uh, in Photoshop. Mm -hmm. Um, let's take a look at now. Uh, let's take a look at this uh, beach rock image, just because it is the image that's on the cover of your book, and um, um, I just found it to be interesting. And I wasn't quite sure Wait. whether or not you were going for the black and white, or if the color was the the color image was sort of your what you had visioned in your head as a final product. Um, both, actually. Uh, I wanted when I this 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 image this, this image sat on my computer for probably about three or four years, and I would I would play with it now and again, uh, and, and I couldn't get what I wanted out of it. I couldn't I couldn't I was having difficulty finding a way to to maintain the sheen in some of the rocks like this sort of pinkish rock over on the right side, or the one. Um, just to the the left of the of the blue rock in the middle, and these colors, th these are the colors of the rocks. Uh, I didn't I didn't play around with the, the the saturation much at all. These were the colors of the rocks. What I when I finally came up with something where I could I could with using the traditional tools, where I could um, preserve the the sheen that the the strong side light from the the sunrise early morning light was giving. It had a very garish look. Uh, it was it was very oversaturated, uh, and, and the it, it was it was it was overdone. It was too much. It looked like a bad HDR um, tone mapping. <laughs> so then, when I when I started um, using the, the the digital zone system method, I went back to this one, and. I was able to create uh, both the color and the black and white that I really was happy with. The, and why I was happy with them is that I was able to, to retain the, the sheen from the, from the light without the exaggeration in the colors. And so, um, and, and while these are two separate images, if I were to pull it up on my computer, it's actually one image file. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the other things that, that this method allows you to do is it allows you to have both a black and white and a color image in the same image file. Hmm. And what you do is you, you just turn off a few of your adjustment layers um, depending on which one you want to uh, which one you want to, uh, to want to work with. Interesting. So these techniques um, for me, as a beginning photographer, a lot of this is definitely, it, it's over my head. So is this a technique that a beginning photographer should strive for? Um, it, basically, who's going to be best benefited by this technique? Here. Well, I consider myself to be, I consider myself to be an an intermediate Photoshop user. Um, none of none of the techniques that are used are, I don't think, really really advanced. Um, so, is it something that a, a beginning photographer should aspire to try and use? I would say, 
I mean, I guess there are there are a couple of there are, there are some photographers who they they shoot JPEG and they're happy with that and that's great. And for the, for them, this is this is not going to do anything for them. Um, but for those who who um, want to explore a little more um, and want to want to look at the possibilities and shoot raw, then I would say, yeah, sure, give it a try. Because as I say, it's not using it's not using really really advanced tools within Photoshop. Um, it's using curves, it's using levels, it's using hue saturation. Um, you know, it uses layer blend modes, but they're not they're not really really difficult. To figure out, um, so it's not using anything really, really complex. It, it's just um, the the masking part of it takes a little bit to get used to. Mm -hmm. But there are, actions, there are actions that we've programmed that people can download from the Rocky Nook site, um, and the link is in the book. Um, so that makes setting up the the masks easier. So yeah, I would say I would say sure. If if someone who's who's beginning who wants to who wants to explore more, more and uh, um, and see what they can do with their with their pictures, yes. Okay. Um, Jack, did you have any questions for Bob? Um, I know that you shoot a lot of HDR and obviously wrote a book about it. <laughs> So, um, have you used any of these techniques, or you know, do you have any questions? Oh, I've got a lot of questions. Um, <laughs> um, I think. Well, let me just start with a statement here. Um, I, the thing that I think that is very interesting that Bob's talking about here is, yes, looking at this at first. Again, any new methodology does feel a bit daunting. Um, we are very much in an instant. Instant fix, one button, slap up a whole bunch of you know effects, treatments, masks on, you know the whole Instagram sort of nation thing. Which, um, I mean, more photos are being shared, but more photos. I, I think the more photos that are shared with just a quick slap filter and being thrown up on Facebook, um, lends an air of disposability to them. Um, I think photographers who want to slow down and actually explore the crap, whether they go into the digital zone system or they start learning some, you know of the HDRI techniques or just simply moving beyond JPEG or even shooting, um, starting to work on their photos by adjusting some of the sliders in Adobe Camera Raw, whether it's a JPEG or Raw, um, you know, to kick the luminance up here as opposed to just clicking auto and shipping it off. Um, it, it's all part of that process to learn and I've always been a hands-on learner. Um, and I've also been the kind that sees the work of other people and I read half a book and I sort of read it and as quickly as I can, uh, you know, just go out and try to take some shots to apply that technique um, and sort of think with a think with a goal in mind. I think, you know, it's sort of that whole circle. When you start thinking more about the processing, you're going to start again going back to one of uh, Ansel's, uh, Adam's big terms of pre-visualization where you go out into the field with a thought in mind and whether that's <clears throat> whatever sort of project you're working on um, you know there are there is such a thing as happy accidents but there is also you know going out with the intent of saying I'm gonna go look at the light and I'm gonna look at you know a tool like the photographer's ephemeris to say when is the light gonna be good in this area like I want all of these beautiful trees to have their their sunset and their shadows at sunset lined up perfectly when does this place hinge, and what can I do to bring out that tonal range? It's all part of, uh, I mean, what can be best described as, you know, sort of this backlash against the disposability of it and having a bit more object permanence in that slow, methodical um, style of photography. And right now, actually, what I'm into most is uh, a little bit of convergence with time lapse. And mm -hmm. again, that's another one of those things that's thoughtful, and it's you have to have ideas in the field, you have to have ideas of how you're going to process that and on top of how you're going to process that there are now new ways of expanding the tonal range, compressing the tonal range, I mean, uh, tonal range in Photoshop. Uh, I mean, Photoshop CS6 has a new video component in it. It's um, 
it's a very great time to actually dig in and grab any angle of this and just say, I'm going to explore this and I'm going to start making and creating more in this, using all of these fantastic creative tools that are out there. And it, it's not that scary. It's, it's not that scary to learn how to use, you know, the advanced settings on the camera, which give you more control. And it's, you know, I mean, one of the things people get nervous about manual mode, but the one thing that a lot of beginners don't realize is it's metered manual. It's going to tell you, it's going to give you some hints and tips, and, you know, you're going to learn when you're going to overexpose, when to underexpose. And, uh, you know, it's, I think it's all just, it's fantastic to see a, this book about this new methodology to get creative photographers and photographers who really want to explore the craft of it um, excited to share their share their work and just explore it further so I, I mean from that end it's uh, I, I just think it's absolutely spectacular um, and uh, I, I, I really like hearing anyone's methodology create um, images that just are better expressive and I, I mean the thing I really like about this Bob is um, you focus so much on the technique but the whole point of the technique is to overcome some of these image artifacting things, like how to get cleaner shadow noise, uh, you know, cleaner shadows and a richer tonal range, so that sort of that whole process at the end should disappear so people can focus more on the end result, which is, I think, pretty much, I mean, everybody, you know, there, there is a bit of gear geekiness in everyone who, so many people would pick up on this, but it's really the, you know, the end result is the thing, and uh, I think you offer a very cool guideline on how to, you know, take it to the gorgeous print. Um, so, you know, good on you. Thanks. Um, you, you, you're right that, that it, it is heavy on technique, but I've I tried to make the technique, um, well, it is, you know, I mean, well, it is a, a book about a technique. Um, I tried to make it not so heavy that people couldn't get through it and and to use it and to, to put the technique in terms of, of, of practical end use, uh, which is, you know, as, as you said, getting that, that ultimate expression of the photograph, which is which is a print. Um, and, and and your point about pre-visualization is is well made as well as well made too. There are a couple of um, there are a couple of things I talk about in here. Um, specifically with a couple of images where I went out with a specific idea in mind and how with um, and how with some of the traditional tools I wasn't quite able to get there but with this they just took them that next little level but that's that's not so much the point is you can't get there if you don't have an idea of where you want to go to start with you know if you if you get in a car and just drive you're going to get somewhere, but you don't know where, and you may not know how you got there or how to get back. But if you get in the car with a destination in mind and a route, uh, a fairly defined route picked out, it's going to be a much more, uh, you know, it's going to be a much more interesting, interesting experience. I have to say, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, that's it. Oh, okay, <laughs> I have to say that as you know, a, a photographer learning, um, that is one of the lessons that uh, I hear quite a bit: is have a vision in mind of where you want to go, and then find the tools to get there. And um, I know for me, it's all about getting that translation of what I see before my eyes translated through the camera onto the final image and I'm still learning how to do that but this is going to be an interesting tool when I'm more advanced and actually know how to maneuver through Photoshop um, you know to, to add to the arsenal and having that end result be you know now the rest of the world can see what I'm seeing and not the camera's interpretation of what I'm seeing so Excellent. and that's and that's that's a great point. Is if you leave it up to the camera, then you get what the engineers at Canon or Nikon or Sony think you should have. Whereas if you take control yourself, 
and and go on that that journey from you know start to finish the pre-visualization that Jack talked about then you're taking control and you're the one who's deciding how your your picture ends up looking mm -hmm. awesome well, um, I think we're going to start to wrap things up. Again, congratulations on finishing a book. That's a huge feat. Uh, now, with all this spare time on your hands, <laughs> uh, what's, what's coming up next for you? Um, well, I'm, as, a, as a freelance photographer and writer, um, I'm always you know, working to try and, and generate new, new business. and. Uh, uh, New clients. Um, I had a, a fairly busy summer with uh, some interesting um, projects for some for some clients. Uh, I just finished an article uh, last week that will be in uh, coming out in a, in a in the February issue of a magazine called National Speed Sport News. Uh, what was that again? Uh, Your audio is a little wonky right now. National what news? Oh, it's a, it's an article that's coming out in National Speed Sport News. There we go. It's a it's a motorsport magazine, and uh, it, it nice. has nothing to do with photography. <laughs> uh, it's an article. Uh, it's an article uh, concussion protocols in major motorsport series. So okay. there you go. Um, <laughs> uh, other than that, um, I've uh, I've got a I've got a, a, an idea for a documentary film that I've been I've been tossing around for a few years. Um, Researching, thinking about, researching, thinking about, and I'm at a point where I think I may be able to start moving forward to to making it become a reality. Uh, stereotypical Canadian, it has to do with hockey. Um, but, uh, <laughs> I have some friends that will be very excited about that. <laughs> we'll see if it, if it comes to fruition, but uh, it, it 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 may. Awesome. Well, that's great. Um, in the meantime, um, obviously, you've got this new book that's out, and um, on the Rocky Nook Facebook page, and as well as on uh, Robert's own, we are going to be giving away copies of the book um, this month. So uh, go and check our Facebook pages. That's Rocky Nook, and um, Robert's is RF Photography, and that's RF Dash Photography, correct? Um, my Facebook. Yeah. Oops, hang on. Your, what your website as well? Let's give everybody the URL. It's rf-photography.ca because he is. That's the, that's the website. Um, the um, my Facebook page is rf photography Canada, all one word. Rf photography Canada. Okay. Rf photography Canada. Great. And I'll put those yep. posts at the bottom of this hangout as well and um, on the YouTube page. So I'll put those URLs up. All right. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. I appreciate your time. And again, congratulations on the book. And Jack, thank you for joining. And, of course. Uh, good to be here. Yeah. It was great to talk to you all. So um, enjoy the Thanks. rest of your day, and uh, we'll catch up soon. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Jack. Thanks. Bye -bye. Absolutely. Congratulations, Bob. Bye. Thanks, Jack.